Okay, so guys, I want you guys to imagine that you're heading to the grocery store and you need to buy something. What? Now, the something, the something could be something simple like you want to buy a can of soup. Well, you could sometimes just buy literally one can of soup. But there are certain items that when you purchase them, buying them one at a time is ridiculous, right? And even soup's a good example because although you could buy them one can at a time, you can also buy them, say, in a 12-pack. Does that make sense? And often in, in real life scenarios, it makes sense to group them together. And I mean, this is really common. We might say that the 12 pack of eggs is a dozen eggs. You guys have heard that before, right? No. There's lots of other ways that you can purchase stuff as well. You could buy them, buy them one at a time. You can also purchase something like in a club pack, like say a 12 pack or a, maybe more than that, right? But another way that you can purchase things is based on weight. When you guys buy produce, or maybe if you were to go down the bulk aisle, uh, you would not buy, say, grape. No, that's a bad example. Yeah, that's a good example. You wouldn't buy grapes, one grape at a time. That's kind of silly, right? But when you buy, like, one of those packages of grapes there, um, usually you're buying it at, like, I don't know, five ninety nine a kilogram, or you know what I'm saying? You don't necessarily buy by the, uh, by the group either, because each one is maybe, like, slightly different. No? And so I want to try to use those analogies to describe how chemists had to solve some problems with trying to keep track of weight and keep track of mass once they started figuring out the periodic table. So I want you to use those three kind of thoughts in your head of how you can buy food. You can buy something individually. That works. You can buy things on mass if you'd like, like a 12-pack or a club pack of something. But you can also buy stuff per pound or per kilogram as well. That makes sense so far? Okay, so let me present to you the problem that chemists had then. They wanted to be able to know how heavy every element was. However, there's a problem. Okay, let's use, uh, let's use hydrogen as an example. I'm just going to go off my notes for a second here first. Uh, hydrogen, if you count it one at a time, let's say that you wanted to buy just one hydrogen atom, which in the chemistry world is completely nonsensical because when are you ever going to have one hydrogen atom? Just, just, just one, right? I mean, first of all, if hydrogen's by itself, normally it comes in twos, right? But let's just bear with me for a sec. What if you wanted to buy just one hydrogen? Well, you might write it like this. This is the notation we've learned in the past, H with like a 1 over 1. What does this mean about the internal structure of what you're getting when you buy this hydrogen? How many protons are you getting? Yeah, you're getting one proton. How many neutrons are you getting? No neutrons. And you're probably getting one electron. Let's call them atoms for now, just to keep it simple. Right? So this is what you'd be getting with your one atom purchase of hydrogen. Well, there was another problem, however. When you go to buy your hydrogens, some of them look like this, but some of them look like this. So imagine that you're going to the store and you want to buy a can of hydrogen. Well, this hydrogen right here has one proton. This hydrogen over here still has one proton. But what's different about the second one here? It has a neutron. Does that make sense? And so it would be like going to buy this can of soup right here and this can of soup right here, but this one right here is heavier than this one right here. All right? Now, I know my food example breaks down in times here, but that wouldn't really be fair, right? Like if I were to pay 99 cents for this can right here, which weighs one, <laughs> I'm going to give you a second here. If you've got to pay 99 cents for this can right here, which weighs one, but you could also pay 99 cents for this can right here that weighs two, that, that doesn't fit. You get what I'm saying here? And there's even another problem with hydrogen. There are some hydrogens out there that look like this, where you still get one proton, because that's what makes it hydrogen, but this one has two neutrons and one electron. You guys get what I'm saying here? What, what do we call these types of hydrogen when they have different numbers of neutrons. You guys know the, the word we use? Isotopes, yeah. And so there was the first problem that scientists had, is that they wanted to weigh and know how heavy different elements were. But the problem is, is that hydrogen is not consistent, and neither is any element, because of those stupid neutrons, right? The number of neutrons changes, and yet we still call it hydrogen. Does that make sense? So rather than using my store example of buying things one can at a time, Maybe it's better to think of it as maybe what we need to do is we need to buy it like by the weight, by like the like pay by weight, right? 
So let me use another example. Let's say I want to buy raisins. Okay, this raisin right here and this raisin right here. If I bought, if I, if I just literally bought two raisins, which I know is dumb, but bear with me, would the first raisin weigh exactly the same amount as the second raisin? Probably not. Right. And the third raisin probably weighs something different too. Are they going to be close to each other? Yes, but they're probably not the exact same weight. And that's the same problem with isotopes, is that the first carbon atom and the second carbon atom and the third carbon atom, they might actually individually each have a different weight. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we average them. Right? That makes sense. So when you're going to the store and you buy raisins in the bulk bin, you don't literally buy them one at a time and count them up and say, okay, uh, I've got 4,372 raisins in here. Right? You just put it on the scale and they just pay by the average weight, right? And although each individual one weighs a little bit differently, because there's a lot of them, then you just use the average. Does that make sense? Well, this is why on your periodic table, the weight for hydrogen on the, let's see, usually the, the little square on your table gets written like this. There's like hydrogen right here. And then up at the top here is the number one, because that's its atomic number. And then somewhere around here, you might see like 1.01. .01. You guys know that number I'm talking about? This number right here, then, is the average weight. Sound good? That's the average weight. Because does can an individual, like if you could buy one raisin, which I know is dumb, but if you could buy one, is, is it? In terms of hydrogen, can it actually weigh, can one atom weigh 1.01? .01? It can weigh one, or two, or three, right? But you can't have like half of an electron, or half of a proton, or, or half of a particle. You get what I'm saying here? So um, of these three isotopes of hydrogen, if the average weight is 1.01, .01, what's probably the most likely uh, isotope of hydrogen you would find if you went to go buy some hydrogens? The hydrogen one, right? You might be lucky once in a while and find the hydrogen too and be like, oh, cool, a free neutron. Right? <laughs> right? And once in a while, you might like have like a really special one that has two free neutrons attached to it. Right? That I mean, if you like that analogy, it would be like you're in the raisin bin and all of a sudden, you know, you dig through, whoa, there's a really big one in there. Cool. Right? Okay. I know my analogy's not perfect, but does it kind of make sense here where I'm going? So this was actually a great way to help solve the problem of how do I weigh these things because on an individual basis, they'd have to be in whole numbers, right? Uh, if you want to use like a math term, they would have to be like whole number integers. You can't have like a fraction of an electron. However, on mass, because of the fact that we can't know which in each individual one is, we just need to use an average. Okay, So that solves problem one. Second problem. Just like with my grocery analogy and buying raisins, who buys two raisins? Who buys one raisin? That's dumb, right? We need to buy them in groupings of something. So just like where you can buy one can of soup, but sometimes it's smarter to buy like the 12-pack. Right? Scientists realize that as well, is let's not weigh these things one atom at a time. Let's weigh them in a large grouping at a time. Now, in grocery stores, a common number for whatever reason is 12. Right? And I mean, this happens a lot. Like when I buy my daughter's yogurt tubes, they're in 12s. When we buy eggs, they're in 12s. When I buy soup, they're in 12s. Craft dinner, 12s. I don't know why. Just 12 ended up being a dozen, and that's like a really good grouping. Does that make sense? Well, in chemistry, um, let's go to my notes now. A really smart guy named Avogadro. Maybe you've heard of him before. Avogadro. It's like avocado, since we're talking groceries here. Avogadro realized that counting atoms one at a time is also utterly ridiculous. We can't go to the store and buy raisins one raisin at a time. It makes way more sense to buy them just in a large grouping of them. Does that work too? And so Avogadro decided, and I have no idea, just like with why 12 is a dozen, I'm, I'm sure we could Google this at some point, but for the life of me, I don't know how he decided to use this number right here as the grouping. But this is what convention has started to be. It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So rather than counting eggs one at a time, we buy them in 12s. Rather than counting atoms one at a time, we group them in that numbers, which is just a, a, a lot. 
Okay. Does everybody understand the notation 10 to the power of 23, what that means? Okay, let me make sure it's clear then. So the 10 to the 23 means you'd take this number 6.02 and you'd times by 10, and then you'd times by 10 again, and then you'd times by 10 again, and then you'd times by 10 again, and you're going to do this 23 times, which means that this number would be 6021234. There. In case you're wondering how big that number is, that would be this number right here. Is that anybody here, by the way, that, that's their car? You're good? <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> okay. So, is that you? I didn't know. Go look. <laughs> you don't want a dead battery in the rain. <laughs> okay, anyways. Do you guys hopefully get how my analogy fits here? We can't buy things one at a time at the grocery store sometimes. We can't buy atoms one at a time in the chemistry store. It's just, it's not logical. However, 12 atoms is still not enough, right? It, like, in order to have enough of something to be measurable at, at our level, we need to have a lot. So that is how many atoms you buy in a grouping. And so by combining those two concepts together, first the concept of we're going to need to average the isotopes, and second the concept that we need to count atoms a lot at a time. We can't just buy them one or two at a time. What we have now is a, a ratio. And these numbers that you find on your periodic table, this number right here, its units are, there are 1.01 grams, that's the average weight, in one mole. And one mole is really this many atoms. That's what these numbers mean. So it's like it's a ratio of two parts. The first part is, how heavy is it? And the heavy is an average number. Okay, because I don't know how much an individual one is, but I can tell you what the average happens to be. But it's divided by per this many items that you're using. Okay, so as an example, take a look on your periodic table at carbon. Carbon has the number 12.01. What does that mean? Well, that means that if I were to go to the grocery store, the chemistry grocery store, and count up 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules of carbon, right? And so I go to the bulk bin, and I start scooping in carbons, <laughs> and I literally count them up, which would be ridiculous, but let's say I did that, right? And I discover that I finally had that many carbons. Individually, they all weigh something different, right? Individually, they all have a different weight. However, I now know the collective weight of them is going to be 12.01 grams for all of those. So again, you know how you go to the store and you take your bag of bulk stuff and you put it on the little scale to see how much it weighs? Well, that's what this information on the periodic tells you. It tells you if you have this large number of atoms, now we know how heavy they are. Was it you? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing you found out. <laughs> okay, so let me go back to my notes. If you guys get this concept then, uh, this is a very math-based section here. Where we need to know basically how heavy these large groups of atoms are. So, um, yeah, I think I've made my point on this stuff here. What else can we do here? Let's try an example. What if you were to go to the store, go to the bulk barn section, and you want to buy some magnesium fluoride, MgF2? Well, you want to have four moles of it. How many atoms would you have? Well, I even have the calculation on here for you. I don't need you to actually do the math. Right? But if you had four moles, each mole is this many atoms or this many like particles. Maybe that's a better word to use. There's this many molecules in one of those moles. So you know how you could buy one kilogram of something or two kilograms of something? Well, here if I want you to buy four moles of them, all we have to do is take 4 and times it by that value. In the same way, what if I were to say, go buy 4 dozen eggs? How many individual eggs is 4 dozen eggs? 4 dozen would be 48. How did you get that 48? Well, you took 4 and times by 12, because 12 is what a dozen is, right? Well, in chemistry, though, a dozen isn't 12. Uh, we use moles. Moles is that number. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of trying to teach kids how to look at units. Can you guys see how this mole unit right here is on the kind of like on the top of like a fraction? Well, what's on the bottom of the fraction actually? There isn't a fraction there, right? So what is on the bottom of this fraction if I made it a fraction? Yeah, one. Okay. Now, right here, though, I have a fraction, right? On the top of the fraction is the word molecules. On the bottom is the word moles. And if you know your math skills, this is on the top, this is on the bottom, they can cancel. And so that's something that I'm going to try to show you today is a good way to kind of keep track of how to use these units. It's kind of similar to, like, this scenario here. Uh, let's say you make, uh, you worked for seven hours, and you make... $15 per hour. This one right here, I know it doesn't look like a fraction, but I mean, there, okay, now it's a fraction. Right. You see how this hour right here and this hour right here for units, one's on the top, one's on the bottom? Well, if you work for seven hours at $15 an hour, well, I'll just take the seven and times by the 15, and that'll tell you how much money you make. Does that kind of concept make sense then? So. Let's do some calculations. If you've got a calculator, we're going to need that for the next ones here. So, um, I do need to point one thing out before we get to that, though. When we are balancing equations like we did yesterday, these coefficients refer to literally one particle of methane, two particles of oxygen, one particle of carbon dioxide, and two particles of water vapor. But, like, are we ever going to do a reaction where you just use just, just one atom? Well, that's ridiculous, right? But kind of like in math, and I think most of you have done an example like this already, you can upscale the entire equation, right? Like, you can multiply both sides of an equation by 10 or both sides of an equation by 4. Well, really, that same concept applies to chemistry, too. Rather than making this one particle of CH4, why don't we make it 6 quadrillion, whatever that number is, right? Like 6.02? Why don't we just make it that much larger, make this one that much larger, make this one that much larger, like make them upscale them all. Right. So that same logic applies. Rather than these being particles at a time, we could say that one mole of this requires two moles of this. So if you had 6.02 times 10 to the 23 of this, you would need 12.04 times 10 to the 23 of this one. Is good how I pulled that off there? Right? This to this, this, well, this one's just twice as big. Okay. Uh, when you calculate your molar mass, then, a molar mass then has to involve all the individual components. Okay. Imagine that you're throwing a, a party and you want to, like, make your own, like, Chex mix. You guys know how, like, you might have, like, some pretzels in it, some Cheerios, some, some cheesies, maybe. Or, you know what I'm talking about here? Well, in, in a way, that's what we have to do here, is you need to go to the bulk bin, and you need to find out, well, how much does peanuts weigh? How much do pretzels weigh? How much do shreddies in bulk weigh? Because you're going to put them all together later. You know what I'm saying here? And that's what I'm going to do in this calculation here, is that if I want to find the molar mass, which is like the weight of, say, sodium hydroxide, I just have to know how much they each individually weigh. So sodium weighs 22.99. Oxygen weighs 16 right on the dot. Hydrogen weighs 1.01. .01. So now I know how much like the whole combination weighs. Right? So if you're ever working with elements on their own, that's easy. But how often are we ever just working with just pure elements by themselves? It's pretty rare, right? So if we're working with compounds, well, then just add up the different pieces, just like you would if you had to buy a little of this from the bulk barn, a little of this, and a little of this. Okay? Now we know how heavy this combination happens to be. Okay, so let's try our examples. Finally getting to this point here. 